event. Uh, we will wait a few minutes to let folks uh, log on and then we will uh, get going. But really appreciative that you're, you're here. The uh, Choctaw people uh, in New Orleans and the Moekma tribe here in the Bay Area. So uh, we would like to honor them and acknowledge that um, this land um, is their sacred homeland. Um, I would also um, I'm, I'd like to say I'm very happy to introduce uh, my colleague and um, professor in Chicana Chicano Studies, Dr. Jonathan Gomez is a scholar and poet who was born and raised in the Barrio City of City Terrace in East Los Angeles. He earned his doctorate from UC Santa Barbara in the Department of Sociology with an emphasis in Black Studies. At SJSU, Dr. Gomez is an assistant professor and undergraduate advisor of Chicana Chicano Studies, where he teaches courses in race, space, and creative and cultural expression. At SJSU, he, is, he also co-facilitates the Culture Counts reading series. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Gomez. Well, thank you so much, uh, Linda, and, and thank you to everyone uh, that is here. Uh, I'm so honored uh, to be with you all today. Um, you know, and before we get going, I just want to say, you know, a, a big thank you to uh, Erlinda Yanez. You know, uh, she is the department coordinator for Chicana Chicano Studies, uh, but really the, the backbone of uh, our, you know, campus community in, in so many different ways, you know, and so I, I want to just thank her for her vision and for the different ways that she pushes to make events like this happen. Uh, for our department as well as for our campus. Um, to, you know, Emerald uh, Green uh, and Armani Donahue of the Black Leadership and Opportunity Center at SJSU, or, or known as the Block. Um, to um, e Elisa, um, who, you know, is also recording for us today. So, you know, thank you uh, so much. And, and Elisa is uh, the program coordinator, excuse me, for the Chicanx Latinx um, Student Success Center, also known as the Centro. And, you know, I'm not sure if they're able, able to be here today, but Lily uh, Pinedo Gangai is uh, the director of the Centro. And uh, I want to thank them for their support, uh, as well as Chris Yang of Mosaic, the Cross Cultural Center at SJSU, um, and my home department, right, of Chicano Chicano Studies uh, for their support and co sponsorship uh, of this event. And lastly, you know, I want to thank uh, members of the uh, Culture Counts Reading Series at SJSU for their commitment uh, to engage in a practice of uh, using the word as a vehicle to um, act in the world, right? And so this afternoon, you know, we come together to engage in a platica, uh, a conversation uh, with Jerome Morgan and Robert Jones of the Freedom Foundations in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, platica uh, or conversation is a key word in the Department of Chicana Chicano Studies here at SJSU. Uh, upon arriving in fall 2018, I recognized that my colleagues engage it as a pedagogical praxis, uh, as a way for us to build a learning community in the department, as a way for our students to be centered in our classrooms, and as a practice that appro um, approaches um, this as an opportunity to inform ourselves about the learning needs and dreams of students who enroll uh, in our courses. Right? In the face of moving online because of COVID-19, our department chair, Dr. Maria Alanis and uh, Erlinda Yanez have informed this practice of di uh, dialogic learning by inviting Chicano Chicano Studies alumni to engage us via Zoom conversations about how they use and inform the knowledge they acquired in Chicano Chicano Studies to serve Chicanx communities. And so the purpose of convening our platicas is to create a space for reaching mutual recognition and mutual respect with people beyond our department and the university, where we can gain heart from people who develop and deploy knowledge in service of creating the collective and collaborative we, rather than the selfish and cutthroat me that is dominant in our society. It is in this light uh, of looking into the world for people who engage in the making of empowered collectivity that we invited Jerome Morgan and Robert Jones to talk with us about the work they do to serve, mentor, advocate for, and walk with young people whose bodies and neighborhoods go hyper-policed 
yet underserved in New Orleans, Louisiana. I met them a few years ago when I was a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara, and they visited to deliver a lecture about their book, Unbreakable Resolve, Triumphant Stories of Three True Gentlemen. And they facilitated several workshops with students, faculty, and staff on their youth-centered pedagogy. Since then, I've had the great privilege of listening and learning from them about how they use different tools available to them and enter the diverse arenas accessible to them to stand with, speak up for, and advocate for youth in New Orleans who are all too often regarded and treated as disposable uh, by the powers that be. It is no ordinary time to gather to talk about the way racialized and gendered communities are regarded as disposable. In the last few years, but really the past decade, we see with painful clarity the violence of policing and the evil of white supremacy that racial capitalism depends on. Everywhere we look, we see that some people's lives are treated as worth more than others. Some live lives of luxury while others suffer the pains of an unlivable destiny. We live in a society suffused with hate, hurt, and fear, in a world where the stranger is not welcome but despised, where impoverished people and the hungry go, uh, excuse me, are not fed, closed, or housed, but instead go disregarded. As we look around us, we see that the economy, the environment, the educational system, and political institutions are in disarray. Racial and religious and sexual minorities are denied their dignity and forced to debate their very right to exist. Our day is filled with obstacles that make a world based on peace and social justice, a world we are worth living in, extremely hard to achieve. Faced with so many constraints in our daily lives, it may seem easier not to know about these things to turn our heads and ignore the forces that wreak havoc all around us. It is important to remember, however, to paraphrase Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore, that constraints are not insurmountable barriers, but situations that require people to use the tools available to them to gain a critical understanding about what is going on, to figure out the right times and right spaces to come together in mutual re uh, respect, and to create a willingness to change the conditions that are killing them and killing us. To be sure, it is hard work to create ways of being that are undergirded by peace and social justice rather than the sociabilities and sensibilities shaped by the pain inflictors of this world. So in this regard, we organize Platicas in an effort to gather with people who make strides to make the world a better place in spite of all this. Our esteemed guests, Jerome Morgan and Robert Jones, understand that you cannot beat hate with a bigger hate. Instead of encouraging us to be ruthless with the ruthless, they lead with what New Orleans poet Sonny Patterson calls a love-driven politics that empowers people to turn segregation into congregation and to create social networks that allow bystanders of racialized and gendered exploitation to become upstanders for peace and justice. They are men who have been through the worst of the worst, yet have maintained a promise to do the best of the best for communities of people who are hyper-policed by different law enforcement agencies and overlooked by political officials and major institutions in their society. In fact, the Freedom Foundations was envisioned while Jerome and Robert were incarcerated in Louisiana State Prison in Angola, serving life sentences after being wrongfully convicted for crimes that they did not commit. Following their release and while fighting for their exoneration, they reunited with Daniel Rideau, uh, another former prisoner, as free men and created the Freedom Foundations. They immediately began to serve disregarded youths in a city that is number one among all US cities at caging people, in a state that is number one among all US states at caging people, and in a country that is number one at caging people among all countries on the planet. Louisiana's prison sentences are among the harshest in the country. The state leads the country in the percentage of inmates who are serving life without parole and exceeds the national average for the number of nonviolent offenders who are locked up. In Louisiana, locking up as many people as possible for as long as possible is a practice that has long enriched a few while making everyone else poorer and worse off. Here, as is true of all carceral geography, public safety is structured in light of profits. In academic and public investigations, we know about the histories, policies, and practices that lead to mass caging. And of course, we should always know about these and make them known always so that we can be critically informed as we go about abolishing the relations of power that undergird carceral geographies. However, 
following the insight of Rebecca Carter from her study, Prayers for the People, Homicide and Humanity in the Crescent City, we know far less about the systems and structures of Black humanity. It is in this regard that we invite Jerome and Robert here in this platica to speak to the work they do to affirm, value, strengthen, and celebrate Black people and the various communities they encounter in the work they do to serve many disregarded youths. So um, I just want to thank, you know, Robert and Jerome for agreeing to engage us in this platica. Uh, the floor is yours. And I ask everyone to uh, listen and to be ready to engage uh, with them in, in conversation. Thank you. Could you go to slide two, please? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay. All right. Greetings, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for having us. Um, I mean, it's it's indeed an honor to to be in this kind of conversation um, moving forward and trying to figure out a lot of our problems and come up with our solutions. Uh, and I, I'll begin with a, a, a snapshot of, 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 of my story and what happened to me, right? Uh, I grew up in uh, a very poor environment, uh, came from a single parent household with five other siblings. Um, I mean, I did, did the average things that the average Black or brown boy doing those particular environments, an environment that was uh, polluted with crime, uh, hate, and a variety of things. So eventually, uh, I made a lot of mistakes, and I became uh, a product of my environment, uh, to say so. Um, and eventually, that led to me dropping out of school in the eighth grade, and not long thereafter, uh, at the age of 19, I was arrested, falsely arrested, and accused of crimes that I did not commit. Uh, I stayed in prison, uh, the parish uh, jail, rather, for four years, uh, while I was district attorney in, here in New Orleans, uh, the older district attorney, of course, uh, Trump up a lot of charges and built a uh, weak case against me and eventually convicted me and sent me to the Louisiana State Penitentiary, or should I say the Louisiana Slave Plantation, that's what I call it. Uh, went there at a very young age. Um, when I went there, I seen how so many men was broken inside the institution, uh, how that I had to pick cotton, you know, like, you know, it's this thing about that, you know, you coming from an environment that, that, I mean, to, to go to another environment and actually pick cotton uh, for a living for, uh, for institution. That's how I know it was slavery. Uh, so after being there a while, seeing how many guys had broken spirit and there had only a few guys who was headed towards the gate, meaning that they was doing real productive things uh, to try to get out of prison. So those are the guys that I actually follow. Uh, so in 1996, uh, that was the year I actually got convicted. But I can tell you this, and I always like to share this story because it was a turning point in my life. In 1996, I was found guilty. I was numb. I mean, I just, I, I, I couldn't bear it, right? But that wasn't the worst thing that happened to me in 1996. In 1996, I lost my younger brother uh, to street violence, right? I, lost, he, I mean, that was like sort of my only support system. And I, I'll never forget that day when I, I, I walked the yard, I cried and a lot of despair, uh, frustration. And an older guy who I met when I, when I first got there, he was a, a, a boxing trainer. And he seen me in the moment of his spirit and he walked up to me and asked me to say, Robert, what's going on, man? I can see you going through some things, right? I said, well, uh, I mean, I, I, I really, I couldn't put it in words. So he said, I'm gonna tell you about this. He said, man, life is like boxing. You know, uh, every time life throw you a punch, you gotta throw a counter punch, right? You gotta, throw a, you gotta throw a punch back because if you don't fight back, life will knock you out. 
right? Just like you, you're in the boxing ring. And that said well with me. When I went back in my cell, a, a light came on. I said, you know what? I got to fight back. I got to fight this particular system. I'm not going to be no slave. As the 13th Amendment said, I am a slave because of the fact that I was convicted. And you can use my uh, 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 voluntary servitude to make me a slave. I'm not going to be no slave. So that perk, uh, I started re-educating myself. I, I went and got my GED. I uh, uh, enrolled in several uh, college courses, um, corresponding courses, of course. And, and it, wasn't that, it wasn't because I wanted to be one of the smartest person in the world, right? I, want, I did not want to be that same 19-year-old kid that stood before a system that convicted me and were using jargon that I totally didn't understand. So I re-educated myself in law, the laws that govern me and others, uh, politics, uh, government affairs, uh, psychology. I wanted to learn all these things because my mind was at, the, at, at that particular moment was more like, I'm gonna return back into society, right? And I'm not gonna return to society without having that knowledge. So over the years, I, I, I re-educated myself and I continue on the fight for myself and others. Um, and then I met Jerome. Me and Jerome, uh, we talked about different things that we wanted to do because he was in the same mind state. He, he didn't see himself as a slave. He wanted to be free, just like I wanted to be free. And we talked about the organizations and how people organize um, uh, was was sort of contrary to what they what, what they should have been doing in order for to make real change. Uh, so we talked about those different things. We talked about Creative Freedom Foundation, and and as you can see how it's spelled, it's free them, not freedom. It's free them, and that means free them for all system of oppression. And that's why we that that's 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 the meaning of free them foundations. It's free them from all systems of oppression. So. Eventually, uh, Jerome went through his proceeding. I'll let you tell you. you know, I'll let you him tell you about that. But he eventually got out. When Jerome got out, uh, I followed maybe about a year after him. And when I got out, Jerome was able to help me make my transition back into society. And together, we reunited with um, um, Daniel Rito. And we started talking, we formed Freedom Foundations. And he said, man, let's put all the stuff that we learned inside the institution, our own experience from coming from these same communities and let's start making it work. And that's how Freedom Foundation come about. And I'll let Jerome tell you his story. You're muted. You're muted. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I want to say good evening to everyone. Thank you, Robert. Uh, you know, he's the president. I'm the vice president. Uh, it's totally my honor to have a presence here today uh, with you all. I thank Jonathan, Erlinda, and my brother Robert for the opportunity to create harmony from the chaos of all our sufferings. Thank you to your viewers uh, for having the courage to invest your time right now to bring justice to the world. Um, I was born in New Orleans, uh, April 1976. At the tender age of three, I was placed in foster care due to my parents being incarcerated. However, the foster home was in Pontchartrain Park, a neighborhood that, will, that you'll find in the National Registry of Historical Places for being built by and for Blacks in 1954, a Black community that maintained 98% home ownership up until Hurricane Katrina. During my childhood, I learned a lot about the essence of community, all while suffering from the importance of having both your own parents in the household. Um, if you want to know more about my childhood, please go to the chat and inquire about how you can purchase a book entitled Unbreakable Resolve. Uh, like they said, that's a book that I co-authored with Robert Jones and Daniel Rito, and it only cost $20. It will also give you more detail about me being wrongfully convicted in 1993 at the age of 17, making my own critical transition into adulthood in a prison and on the plantation all at the same time. Uh, I was sentenced to die in Louisiana State Prison at Angola 
by the expiration of my young life. No benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. A month later, my son Justin was born and I only saw him once my entire time incarcerated. It was there that I got my GED, taught myself to cut hair and became a prison barber by the unanimous request of cell block prisoners. I found therapy in my love for writing, learned business, obtained two separate degrees in graphic communications, created and facilitated self-help peer and youth group programs for prisoners and mentored high school students in New Orleans from prison. I received a list of educational, spiritual and athletic certificates, much too long to name and studied the law enough to help myself and others to this very day. I was able to do all these things despite receiving over 80 fabricated write-ups in prison, placed in solit solitary confinement on four different occasions for no less than a year at a time and being sent to the working cell blocks too many times to count. Finally, in 2014, I had my wrongful conviction overturned with the legal assistance from Innocence Project New Orleans, a pro bono law office, and a community presence from students, students at the center a student-led youth organization. I was able to bond out that year, February the 4th, and placed on 24-7 home incarceration and weekly drug testing for two years until I was able to avail heavy re-prosecution in May 2016 when the charges were forced to be dismissed as the Justice for Jerome campaign grew, grew support from a local coalition called Justice and Beyond. Uh, in 2015, I created Hulk Roots Productions, and helped to create Real Gentleman Barbershop in a space created by John Thompson, another wrongfully convicted brother who, who founded Resurrection After Exoneration, a transitional space for returning citizens. Once my big brother Robert Jones was relieved of all his charges, we then officially founded Freedom Foundations. Before then, while fighting those charges, we worked in local high schools as guests with teachers working for students at the center. Due to these roots, a collection of writings during those times from myself, students, uh, teachers, and parents, 2,000 uh, 2, pages long, entitled Go to Jail, Confronting Systems of Oppression is due out any day now, which is published by the University of California, Santa Barbara. Moreover, since being released, we have changed the narrative of black guys uh, returning to society from prison. We take the obligations to be a positive black uh, male figure to our youth and their families. We are at full service to our community uh, in demanding changes that range from Jim Crow, non-unanimous jury laws, uh, parity for the public defender's office, increasing compensation laws, stopping funding for non-existing DA programs, supporting the election of several progressive leaders into office and creating jobs for our own to start in our own businesses. On top of all that, I proposed to the love of my life in 2019. So a wedding is coming soon and we welcomed our newborn daughter Justice into the world February, 2020, right before COVID. And she makes 14 months on the 21st. And so I wanna throw a bit of a wrinkle in this right now, uh, move to, as we move to slide uh, four and ask uh, Armani Donahue to read uh, slide four. And I'll expound on it after she finished reading. Thank you. Sure. All right. Slide Can four. everyone? Slide four. That's fine. Oh, apologies. Go back one. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, what we do? Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, FDF was created to help disregarded youth, especially black and brown boys with a critical transition from childhood to adulthood. We provide a safe space within the impoverished communities for these of these young boys. The organization is rooted in community-based education, community building, skill set development, and youth justice advocacy. These serve as our pillars to drive change within the broader community and end neighborhood crime, poverty, and mass incarceration. We are we are a mission-driven organization that uses a transformative slash preventative strategy to disrupt or end poverty and op oppression in black communities. Our aim is to foster change from the bottom up by building stronger families, community-based capital and skilled young people that make sound decisions. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Donahue. Um, so uh, what we do is, is become our own doctors to the traumas of our community. Uh, essential to our own trauma care is administering trauma counseling to members of our organization. It enables us to use all of our horrible experience in a way that will help someone get through similar, ex similar experiences or prevent them from having those types of sufferings. Our organization bridges the gap between our missing community members returning to society and the disregarded youth who suffer from not having a positive male figure in their immediate community. Notice I say immediate and not media. This natural structure supported by a positive environment, notice I say positive and not unchallenged. It dispels the inadequacies in our embattled returning citizens and our disregarded youth as one immediately benefit, benefits from the other. It's like the wisdom of our youth's past meeting, meeting the newness of the community's future. What I mean by this is somebody returning from prison can easily appreciate all they can learn from a youngster, especially after being expelled from society for decades. And that youngster can just as easily appreciate a positive male figure who has experience with similar traumatic backgrounds, especially since that youngster has been without immediate positive male guidance all their life. FDF has an in-house curriculum called Gentleman Course. You can go to the website now, which is under uh, reconstruction right now, and see that each of the three main phases of the G course are 60 days in duration and prepares the participant for the next phase of curriculum, which is much about reading, writing, and critical improvisation within our transformative circles. Once the participant completes the curriculum, he will be expected, encouraged, and supported to enroll in any apprenticeship he desires. Once he enrolls, we can then get them into the goal phase. And I'll let Robert expound further. Thank you. All right. Um, going, going into the goal phase, essentially, we we bring um, our youth to a point where once they have absorbed all the information and begin to, uh, uh, to start apply the information that they have learned in all those uh, following phases, uh, the goal phase is more like now you take the action, you go back, you go back in your community, like pay, pay this thing forward. Um, and essentially what we do overall in a nutshell, because Jerome, you know, he, he kind of gave you the meat and bones of everything, but the, the, the bottom line and, you know, for uh, make it easy to understand, basically what we do, we provide all the tools, the fundamental tools that society or systemic uh, uh, racist system have taken away from our youth, from our people. We provide those tools that they have taken away, right? We don't ask the government for those tools, we provide those tools. And we don't teach our boys as, as, as Jonathan had mentioned earlier, we don't teach hate, right? But we teach them, we don't get them to try to change uh, racist folks' mind we try to get them to change their own mind, right? Because in our first phase, the first thing we work on, what we classify as social rehabilitation, right? We we got we got a social rehabilitation first. We got to get these uh, guys to think different, right? Because if you think different, you will live different, and eventually you'll act different, right? So we we goes into the mind first because everything is in the mind. It's just like a a, a Thunder before lightning, right? It's a thought before the action. So you, you, you got to think about the, 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 the concept of, of, of the mindset. And, and that's what we, we work on with these guys. And basically, and another thing I think is key too, that we, we, are, we are definitely going to expound on it. Like we are basically, just think about this. You, I'm going to use this scenario. Uh, 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 just imagine if, if you're walking down the street and you see, a whole lot of potholes in the street, right? When you see those potholes in the street and you're driving your car, you're riding a bike or you're walking, you're not gonna just fall in those potholes, you know? So either you're gonna do two things. You can use what we classify as 
critical improvision, right? And put some dirt or some rocks in that hole so you can roll over it. Or you can you can uh, petition others uh, for the help to fill those holes. And, it, and, and the analogy is this, the moral of the analogy is this, is once you show these young guys of people in the community, the traps that society have placed in, 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 uh, in, in, in their view, once you show it to them, they're not going to, the same way they're not going to jump in that hole, they're not going to fall in that trap. Once you, once they get a clear understanding of it, and that's basically, that's essentially what we do. We just show them all the traps, you know, and then, and fill those traps up at the same time. So that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. All right. Our community impact. All right. And I, I can't see how we, I can't read this because I wanted to read this because this is important. This other piece over well, there. I'll, I'll read it if you can't read it. I'll read it. Uh, I can't see. All right. Yeah, it says uh, we measure success by defining these stats. Over 65% of black male youth without fathers or positive male figures living in impoverished communities exhibit some type of a behavioral disorder, substance abuse, become high school dropouts and get involved in crime. And that's a stat from the US Department of Justice. Right, right. And so our, our impact entails that, you know, that's how we, that's how we measure our success. You know, we had some guys who came into our program, and I could be perfectly honest with you. A lot of those guys, they they came in, they came in with weapons and drugs and all that, right? We told them, like, look, this is not the place for that. Eventually, they got rid of it. And once they stayed in the program, we re-educated them and re rewired them in a sense, right? And Man, if you see some of these guys today, you wouldn't believe where they come from, right? Because of, of the level of a community-based type of education that they receive to change themselves. They are totally different. A lot of them are very productive in society. We have produced uh, some, some high school teachers um, from our program. We produce some welders, a whole lot of college students, um, some engineers, um, some electricians. And a lot of business owners, right? Because that's one of the uh, uh, components of our program. And actually it's the motto of our organization is know thyself, own thyself. So, and and I'll let you hear some of the, the, the impact from some of these guys uh, and and you be judging yourself. Uh, the first one. Happy holidays and happy new years. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Freedom Foundations uh, for, the, for everything that they do in the community. They surely been blessing me um, ever since I was in high school, and they still bless me to this day. Uh, good group of people, um, and just really a big in impact on the community. So um, big thanks to y'all for just blessing uh, me this, this past holiday. Um, it really means a lot, and I aspire to be just like y'all um, and go and make an impact on the com community myself. So. Big shout out to y'all. Thank you, Freedom Foundation, for everything that you do. Continue to do what you do and continue to be great and impact the community and the youth. All right, you can go to the next one. Not a project community, a New Orleans father exonerated after spending 23 years in jail for a crime he didn't commit is making a difference. Robert Jones started a nonprofit aimed to help youth transition to adulthood. And as anchor Christina Watkins tells us, Joan says it's time the community stand behind these kids. I'm happy. I'm totally at peace. That's Robert Jones back in January of 2017, sharing his thoughts after spending 23 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. The steps he took that day after being exonerated led to the life he lives now, one that centered around change. When I was in prison, uh, I, took a, I took a close uh, look at a lot of organizations uh, for the youth, and I seen that you know our youth still was failing at on so many different levels. Jones said he and two other formerly incarcerated men wanted to help New Orleans youth, like Henry Williams and Draylen Reed Evans. So they started Freedom Foundations, a nonprofit focused on mentorship and business development. 
Reed Evans has been part of the program for about a year. I enjoy watching the Cobra. I'm a uh, um, junior high school, and, and I'm trying to uh, move on life with um, playing football, but it's like sitting this night, being a city night. Like, not enough love. Both he and Williams play football at George Washington Carver High School here in New Orleans, and they just made it to the playoffs this season. As exciting as that is, both feel like they don't get the support they need from the community. Right. If you can move to slide six and... Uh... But before they go to slide six, Jerome, I, I, need, I need to say this. Uh, what, we, what we did for Christmas... Uh, for our for 35 uh, of our mentees and and young guys in the community for Christmas, we surprised them uh, not with a, a a gift like generally like most organizations do. Uh, we raised some we raised some money and we gave away nearly ten thousand uh, dollars. Each of our youth got two hundred to three hundred dollars in cash because we wanted them to able to, uh, to be able to purchase their own gift or even purchase a gift for their loved one during this pandemic. And that's that's what this uh this this guy was talking about when our uh, mentees was talking about. Uh and we classified that and we put a challenge to everybody uh that's you know talking about what they're doing for the youth. We call that our extra duty to the youth, you know. And it was so man, so many of those guys bought gifts for their family, their children, their mothers, they they the loved one, it was it was so heartfelt, you know, just that be able to be in that position to help. But that's what community is all about, and that's the type of impact that we have and in, in our community and doing this work. Yeah, great point, bro. I, I'm sorry I'd be kind of modest about these things, but that is a, a, a great point to bring up. And the way that we did it, we wanted to give them cash, like uh Robert said, so they have the freedom of choosing, the freedom of choosing what they wanted to do with that gift. Uh, other organizations, you know, you may not think that that's, that's big, but this is big. You know, they may get them a bike. I mean, I want a bike, I need a bike. Or uh, some other item. And then the item that you get for them is not coming from any source that's supporting the community. You know, and so Robert and I thought about those things and making the decision to give them cash instead of any other gift. But that's a good point. Um, you can move to slide six, uh, Jonathan, and I'm gonna call on slide six. Uh oh. That's slide six? Yep. Okay, uh, well, I'll read this How to Dismantle uh, Systems of Oppression, uh, Identifying the Problems in Black and Brown Communities. Okay, uh, you know, uh, you want me to start off this slide? You can start off, uh, Robert. I'll come behind you. Okay, this is a, this is a piece here. All right, this is where the meat and bones come in. This is what it's all about. All right, the system, the systemic system of racism. Uh, let's let's be clear and let's. Let's be realistic about it. Uh, racism definitely exists in our country as we can see uh, in modern day's time, today's time, and as well as uh, historically. Uh, and racism, as I always give talks on, uh, a lot of folks when they, when they really understand the history of racism, racism came from a place of economical gain, the, 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 the color of individual racism came into play a long time after that. So this, the, the system of racism was basically created to obtain free labor to advance another culture, another ethnic group of people. And through racism and through this particular system to have power of oppression over people, they bring it down, you go into this next thing, it's poverty stricken, right? This is the essence of, of, of what racism is, is, is bringing you to it, and I'm gonna tie it all in. And poverty stricken, I want us to understand uh, poverty, right? 
or poor. And and I I, I want to make this argument. Uh, black people are not poor. Black people are not poor. And the reason I'm saying that they're not poor, because there's a difference be, between being poor and broke. When you're broke, you just run out of finances. So basically, being poor is a mindset. Poverty restriction is a mindset, meaning that you can't produce for self, right? You can't think. You can't advance, right? But if you look at it, every corporation in America, they feed and they get rich off of black and brown people, right? So we are not poor because we can produce but we don't produce for ourselves. We create other industry for this particular system. And they use this particular system and they go off into inadequate education, right? It brings you back to poverty. They don't want you to know anything, right? So they dilute your schools, right? Then they don't give you housing. They don't give you proper housing. They, all, they cram you all up. And what happens when you put people in uh, uh, a crammed up space. Violence occur, right? Violence occur. You don't have no equity in your community. You don't own anything, right? You don't have, and we'll go up into those terms and I want you to understand it. Uh, you don't have no community capital, right? And it goes back into free labor, right? So all these different, these components of all these things tied into poverty, which automatically tied into the systemic system of racism, right? So, and I want you to understand that. And I, for, for all the viewers who listen, I want you to take a deep dive into the mindset of poverty and realize that you're not poor because when you say you're poor, you mean saying that you're giving up. You can't provide for self. You're not poor. We have a rich community. We have a rich culture. But we produce for other people. We are just broke and we are mismanaging our money. Because the dollar, and we'll get into that, it, it don't circulate in our community. We don't support one another, right? Because of this system that was designed to make you support others with your free labor, right? You get paid below minimum wage. You, you, you can't, you, it's, it's, it's so crazy. And it, 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 it really, man, it hardens my heart. I mean, to the extent that you have folks that live in society that work for a system and don't realize and that they're not a part of the solution, they're part of the problem. And they don't realize it. You know, you can be doing the right thing in society. You can go get you a job, right? They're gonna make you a wage slave because you're not gonna make enough money. You're gonna have to work two jobs in order just to uh, 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 rob Paul to pay Peter, you know? So you become a wage slave, but it, and then you might as well just say you got free labor because you can't do anything. You can't create no wealth for your family, right? You can't do those kind of things. So yeah, this system, this is the breakdown of this system. We have studied that and I can tell you inadequate education, when folks are not educated, when you're not educated, you result to violence because you can't, you don't have a thought process to the extent of thinking things through. When you don't have a housing, a stable housing, when you have dysfunctional housing, uh, you don't have no discipline, you don't have no guidance. So the next thing to do is to bring drugs in the neighborhood, give you an a, a, a opportunity where you don't need to have an education because selling drugs, always employ people. They don't, don't care what color you are or what have you. It's always level for employment. And you don't have no equity. You don't have no equity. You don't own anything in your community. You know? And eventually all those things lead up what we call free labor is mass incarceration. Right? And they go right back to the, to, to the point of being poverty stricken. You know, all these things tie back into being poverty stricken that coming from a systemic system of racism. And one last point on systemic system of racism. It's a system. The majority, we have white, white supremacists. However, you have folks that look just like me and you as a part of this system. 
and a lot of them don't even know it. No, so when you look at when not just looking at a, a European or a white man, when you look at this particular system, although they have displayed racism throughout the years, however, I want you to look at the system of racism, right? Look at the system, and you'll start understanding you'll start understanding these things as to why your communities are failing, why you're failing in school, why so many people are being incarcerated, why you're not owning anything. Why you always got the uh, raw Peter to pay Paul? Why you just can't advance? And when you understand all these things and you start realizing that you're not poverty stricken, that you're rich in culture, that you're rich in, in a person, that you're amazing, right? Then you'll begin to, to know who you are and you can maybe project some of that out in your communities in the world. I let you know. Well, that was all uh, my own. Yeah, that was beautiful, brother. Uh, I won't. I don't have to say much to that, but uh, as I expound on it, uh, you can move to the next slide, Jonathan, uh, and I'll let you know. I'll call somebody to read that slide. Uh, but you know, the the system of racism is, uh, in my opinion, to keep people of color broke. You know, as you explained, Robert, uh, the difference between being poor and broke. You know, we're not poor. Uh, we have gifts. We have uh, an inner wealth that we just not aware of uh, and you know, not realizing that all we need in order to attain the things that really matter like adequate education and functional housing and peaceful neighborhoods and equal economics it, is to know that our true work is within oneself. Uh, and so as we move to the next slide, I would like to call on uh, a uh, beautiful name, Emerald Green. Miss Emerald Green to read this next slide for us, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Organize, mobilize, educate, and take action. Organize. Start forming small groups and form coalition with other organizations or groups around these issues mobilize, bringing one big group together aligned with the same vision and mission, educate, develop creative ways on solving these community issues and inform others, take action. Once you have identified your issues and plans on how to resolve them, go put these plans into motion. Thank you, Ms. Green. Thank you, Ms. Green. All right. Uh, you know, in my introduction, you know, you heard some of the different organizations that came together on the one agenda of seeing my release and uh, having the charges dismissed. That was a five year campaign uh, from my first day back in court, November 14, 2011, into my last day in criminal court on my own behalf uh, with the undying support from many different groups, uh, May 26, 2016. We organized, uh, we mobilized, educated and took action with churches, schools, businesses, and community. Uh, we, con we conducted regular meetings, uh, communicated regularly, and planned as much as we could for every possible way that things can go so that we can Im improvise as best we could if we had to, because nothing ever goes exactly according to plan. Uh, you can go on uh, justiceforjerome.org and read about the sequence of events and, and the results that we won. Uh, but this is the simple you know, method that we used uh, to organize and, and, and mobilize and educate and take action. It works, it's, it's a lot of work and it works against what the uh, larger society doesn't want us to do. They don't want us to come together. And I guess that's the difficult part, breaking yourself out this psychological bondage uh, to be encouraged to, to socialize with people. But that's all it's really about socializing with people and having fun, finding freedom and justice at the end result. Uh, so yeah, Robert, you can expound. Take yourself on mute, Rob. And what, what, what we mean by, organ, you know, when you organize, you know, don't think you're going, don't think you need, uh, a hundred to a thousand people, right? When you when you when you think about organize, just because you see that when people organize and they come together, it'd be a lot of them. Just know that 
it, it can only be a few of you, you know, and a few is many. Believe that because a lot of things that have changed, a lot of people that changed the world started with a, a small group of people. You know, it started with a small group of people. And in this piece, when I mean organized, it's, it's like, you know, you all that's in, 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 in school, uh, a lot of times because you're, you're, you're uh, maybe you're working, you're studying, uh, you're away from your communities a lot, uh, especially if you're living on the campus or what have you. And the thing is that you see a lot of those problems that happen in your community and you want, you want to help, right? You want to, you want to do something. You can. You can start by organizing, right? You can, you can start with small groups. It can be four or five of y'all in which you can constantly grow. And y'all take that smaller group because we have did it in here in New Orleans with a lot of these uh, uh, smaller groups. We have formed groups ourselves. Then when I say mobilize, you're bringing all those groups together that have uh, uh, started organizing, you form a coalition, right? You form a coalition of people with the same vision who are the same mind. And some people fall off. Some You'll find that some people are just talking, right? You know, some people just got cheap talk. Some people fall off. So when you when you get that that core group of people that coalition, then what you we you go to identify the problems that you're having in your in your community. You say if you have police brutality, or there's a there's a way on how to deal with that. If you're organized, right? If if you're short of housing, they got high rent going on. They got places for that. So you develop and think about creative ways on how to challenge those things, uh, and. Then the next piece, you just take action. You know, whether if you uh, build a relationship with a uh, legislative, a lot of your church members, a lot of your business owners, and you bring in all these pieces together and, 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 and organizing behind one purpose and one mission and one goal. And what happened is all y'all together, y'all have community capital, capital. And when you think about community capital, that, in, that entails you want it amongst the people that also entails a united vote, right? A united vote, uh, unification of uh, group economics. It's a lot of things that can happen when you're organized and you're, instead of asking somebody else for, to help you, you can help yourselves create, bring jobs to your own community or create some jobs, you know? So that's, that's the kind of like the, um, the full things that we do uh, with other folks and we partner with other organizations, other local businesses, we organize, mobilize, educate, and we just take action. And we are able to hit our targets faster when we use these uh, full basic principles. Next, next piece. Uh-oh. My favorite one here. Uh, who gonna, you gonna read, Jerome? You're on mute, Jerome. I'm sorry, you can start it, Robert, read it. I'm gonna respond. All right. Yeah. Practice transformative solutions. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it again. Practice transformative solutions. Transformative solution is building community, people, organizations to collectively fix the problems in their own communities. And I mean, to create a, a preventive method that prevents crime and prison. Community capital, those terms that you, you heard me using, is the unit of the community. It includes local entrepreneurship, group economics, supporting local businesses that give back to the community create job creation, united the collective voting power. And the next piece, build strong relationship with local businesses and community capital gives leverage for demand, right? And transforming solutions is, is, is the key. This is the solutions that we need because from transforming the solution, you build community power. Right? When you build community power, you can create safe houses. You can create community economics. You can create adequate education. 
right? You can build your own school. And it, it, it's, it's, trust me, it's not hard to do, right? And uh, peaceful neighborhoods. You can create these pe peaceful neighborhoods. I, uh, I, I, I was joking with um, Jonathan the other day when I was telling him that, you know what, a, a lot of things would happen in our community. We always call our community a hood. And, and I understand why, because society has created all these mechanisms and they took the neighbor out the hood. So we only just have a hood. So and our thing is to bring this humanity and peace back and play and put the neighbor back in the hood, right? That's what we want. We want the neighbor to connect back to the hood so we can bring people back together. Uh, but this piece is powerful and I, 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 I hope you all are, are, are getting this and as I can continue on the, uh, to expound on it. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna do that because I'm gonna let Jerome just clean it up. This transformative solution process that we have, I'm gonna tell you what we basically do in this process. We work with a lot of our communities, we work with a lot of uh, local businesses, and just think about it. You got you got corner stores in these neighborhoods, and it's only it's public records, right? It's public records. A lot of these corner stores make one point two million dollars a year, right? Eight hundred thousand. Some of them make half a million dollars. Some of them make two million dollars. All these businesses within the a certain um a radius of the community, they make millions and millions of dollars, right? They're not hiring nobody from our communities and they're not giving anything back. They're coming from other places, from suburban areas and other places. They're making all our money and they're leaving, right? So the thing is that we, when we do just organize and bring this community effort piece together, we go back to these local businesses. And let them know that you're making all this money in our community. If you don't give back to our community, we're not going to support you. So basically, it's a it's a legal shakedown, right? It's, it's it's basically a legal shakedown with some of these businesses. You basically can can get them to give back the community, or you just don't patronize their store. And then it get deeper because not only do they have stores that don't give back, right? And some of them do. I'm not saying all of them. But you have people that fill that store with products on the shelves that, that we all consume that don't give nothing back. They're making billions and billions of dollars off our community. So if they can give back to an organized group of people, when you have community capital, you can create an organization where you can, the money that they give back to you, you give back to folks in your community. You can create jobs and give business to local uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, guys who have construction companies, guys who cut grass, right? Uh, you can pay a, 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 a bunch of teens to go throughout the neighborhood to clean the neighborhood up. Because guess what? Now you have capital that you didn't got from these corporations and these local businesses who have been taking the money from our community from years to give back to our community. So when you think about these things, you, you can build power. And as I said, what it does is it take you out of that poverty mindset and let you know that I am wealthy and that I can do this here. So it, it, it transforms you, right? And now you have community capital because now you have businesses that you work with, you have a uh, 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 the community, you have a power in a vote, you can vote the way you want to vote. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, man, it's so peaceful. And like I said, you can bring that neighbor back to the hood. And I mean, we can we, we can do these things because we have done it. We have done it on a small scale and it, it, it's growing. So the things that we are telling you and we are bringing to you, it's not something that we just thought about. We actually put them in place. You know, we actually put them in place. We, uh, have utilized this and we've seen it that anything that we see that can work on this a small scale can work on a larger scale. But guess what? The same problems that we're having here in New Orleans, you can go in South Side Chicago in one of the urban communities, uh, black and brown communities, and they have the same problem. So if you have the same problems in your neighborhood and in my neighborhood, then the same solution will work for both neighborhoods. Very much true. Um... So I guess uh, in summary, I'll say uh, 
you know, and y'all could write this down, please. Uh, this stuff is important. Uh, transformative solutions are ways in which to create community power, right? Uh, community power is created by community capital, which Robert has told you, which is essentially every inch of individual who has a specific role in the power of the entire group. All right, community power is created by community capital, which is essentially every individual has a specific role, specific role in the power of the entire group. Communities operate as a team and the families provide their support. Uh, in my humble opinion, I, mean, you know, I think this should be the only business in life. Uh, I often tell people that true wealth is not having money, it's having contacts. You know, educe, as students, you should know this, educe, uh, is the root word of education, which means to bring out what's already in you. Not that you need something deposited in you that makes you worth something. So, you know, money is a component of racism. The resources of people rich with purpose is what money is meant to exploit and commodify. So don't fall in that trap because one thing that's worse than physical poverty, as, as the president said, Robert Jones is moral uh, poverty. You can have money and still be miserable. All right, well, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is our question and answers. You can uh, go with your conclusion, Robert. And I'll clean well, it up. I, 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 I'll conclude. I will conclude, I, I will conclude with this. You know, I, I would say that I, I thank y'all uh, for this time because, you know, it, it's a lot of times, you know, when we speak, you know, um, we are obligated to, you know, to, to listen to our own message, right? So there was medicine for me as well. So when I when I speak, I listen to myself and it it, it, it gives me that healing, it gives me that, that confirmation, uh, you know, to keep pushing forward and keep my eyes on the prize and what, you know, what the, what the vision is. So I, I, I hope you all enjoy it. And I definitely would love to engage a lot of you all in your, in your questions because my thing is like, I, like we see it on here, you know, we all we all here to learn, you know, we don't know everything, you know, and we we definitely can, can learn from you all. We wanna learn from you all. Uh, and we wanna basically, you know, we not a one and done type person, you know, y'all stuck with us, you know, so if you're on here, you're stuck with us. You know, because we not know one and done. You know, we like building relationships with folks and continue on this work, you know, and inspiring them to, to, to keep moving forward. Uh, I mean, just think about, you know, from our humble beginnings, you know, we come from our, uh, some of these same neighborhoods that we're going back and um, fixing. Uh, I mean, we could have easily been broken. You know, we have life sentence. I was sentenced to a life in 121 years. And, you know, we overcame that by fighting. You know, we overcame that about educating ourselves, by coming together, by bringing people together and getting out of, out of prison. And we didn't, we didn't help change law. We didn't help got other guys out of prison uh, with these same unified methods. So we know that works. We know it works. I mean, we changed some things that folks say that will never change, you know, but it came from a unified effort, uh, working with various uh, people from different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, no matter what your financial uh, uh, status is, uh, uh, ethnicity, or what have you, you know, we, we work with anybody, you know. So we love your questions. Just come on with them and um, I'm going to try to answer as many as you can. Before you start asking questions, I just want to thank you all. It was my pleasure. Uh... And I hope that you are forming a lot of questions uh, to ask us so you know we can uh, address anything that you need further explanation on or you don't understand. Um, you know, I, we didn't say this, but Robert and I uh, still uh, have civil matters pending in court right now, uh, stemming from our wrongful conviction. So we, we still are fighting, but you know, all in all, I feel very safe to say that since our separate cases has come to the forefront, my case in 2014 and Robert's case in 2015, the streets of New Orleans have been fighting back and they've been fighting back in a major way. You know, as we've mentioned throughout this presentation, we've won beaucoup historical battles. 
beaucoup meaning a lot in French, uh, politically, domestically, but not, not so much economically. But, and that's our point of emphasis today, you know, economics is our fighting agenda. So come on with your questions and we appreciate you all having us. Wow, thank you, uh, Robert and Jerome. We have some questions uh, in the chat. And, uh, you know, the first two, it goes, uh, one is, is what, it, what does liberation look like? And then the other one is, uh, what is your primary motivation in continuing this program? Where do you want to take this uh, in the future? So, Robert? You answer the first one, and I get the second one. Uh, what does liberation look like? I mean, really, I, I guess my answer uh, <laughs> is the same uh, for both questions. Uh, liberation to me looks like a majority black state here in this country. Uh, you know, just to be frank with you, uh, I, I want to start a campaign for that, you know, that hopefully uh, that we end up winning in future generations because if we're gonna have true power, uh, we need a black, a majority, of color state, not saying all, oh, because we we not uh, racist in any form of fashion or, or, or divisive in any form of fashion. We just want to stake at the table, and as my research tells me, uh, you know, other ethnic groups may have majority states, uh, but we don't. We have a lot of majority of cities that's you know tore up and, and corrupted. And so uh, to gain real power, how they have the system of oppression structured, we need a majority state. And so uh, that's what liberation looked like for me here in, in America. I, I can chime in on the uh, liberation as well. Uh, I, will, I will go to our model. Liberation to me is knowing who you are, Right? And owning yourself. You know, owning, owning yourself meaning uh, have an ownership state. You know, uh, have an ownership state. Uh, being free from all these different uh, struggles, all these different things that society have been placing on us. Being free, free from those things by creating the solutions yourself. And what, 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 is, what is my motivation or what our motivation is in doing this work and where we, where we going with it? Our motivation is knowing in real life what happened to our people, knowing where we come from and knowing how uh, people of color have been misused, have been abused, have been destroyed and, and so forth, so on. My motivation comes from that. And I could I continue on to see that, see that that happen until uh, we put an end to it. And I, and 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 I give you I give you an example. Uh, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I I, I kind of wanted to get this out. And I guess some of the folks that understand, maybe not understand the civil rights movement, will, will probably get mad at me. But I'm gonna say it anyway. This is the truth. What happened was, I know you all remember Black Wall Street, right? But in reality, there was black Wall Streets all over the country during those times. Uh, black Wall Street is it, it, known because of it was the one of the most popular and that one of the scores. So they want you to remember that one. So basically, it was a sign to you for basically don't do that no more. Uh, but what happened was during, like, during segregation time, there was two Americas that was being created. Right? Because let's think about it. When they were segregated, they say, as they throw numbers out, they say they had 5 million Americans that there was uh, people of color that they was hiring, right? They say they was paying them a dollar a week, right? If they was giving those 5 million people that was working in, uh, working in, in their industries a dollar, that's, that was $5 million that they was uh, giving out and it wasn't getting, they wasn't getting that five dollars back, right? It was like one cup that was pouring into another cup, right? 
because everything was segregated. They didn't want colored people eating in their restaurants, living in their houses, being around them. So what was happening in the, in the, 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 in the world, in the economy, what they realized was that people of color, America, and the, their wealth was growing. So they had to integrate things in, in order for to get control of your spending power. We have a, a spending power over $1.4 trillion, right? And we don't control anything. We don't control it. And so us coming and unifying and bringing our, our group economics to the table and begin owning things, that's what I see. I see future Black Wall Streets uh, uh, in a sense, not just uh, people of color, but people of reason, peaceful mindset. You can be a green person, right? You can be a green person if you put the right thing. You can live in this in this this peaceful community. That's what I see. I see that that's where it's going, you know. And it's going to be it's because we live in a time of inclusion and exclusion. Either you're for the right thing or you're not. Yeah, thank you both. You know, um, just there's a, a comment uh, from one of my colleagues, uh, Crystal West. It says, "I appreciate all the love and wisdom shared in this space." My father is incarcerated, serving a life sentence, and still fighting his case. There's so much work to do in our communities, and we need each other for our collective liberation. You give me hope, my deepest gratitude. Thank you. And I'm sorry about uh, that. I'm sorry that your family is not around due to incarceration. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Crystal, for sharing that, and I share um, Jerome's sentiment. Uh, Elizabeth asks, um, you know, which state would be best for the majority state? And then the next question is, if DC became a state, it would be the only majority black state in the US. How can organizers here uh, across the country help in that fight? Well, uh, my vote would be, I guess I'm biased, but it's not. It's, it's for a lot of different other reasons, not just because I'm from there, but Louisiana, uh, you know, uh, just because of the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you know, you could have a lot of power with exporting, importing goods and, and products and be in a good position to, uh, you know, to take care of yourself uh, if we were to establish uh, Louisiana uh, in particular as uh, the majority people of color state. Um, uh, yeah, so you know, that would be my vote. Uh, DC, uh, DC, <laughs> I've been to DC, I like DC. Uh, small, it reminds me of New Orleans. Uh, uh, but right. we need, we need some, we me, need some bigger. That. Yeah, right. go ahead, Robert, let, I'm sorry. Let, you, let, you, let, you, let, me, let me add to that. Um, yeah, of Louisiana, tell them why Louisiana. Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me let, let, let me add to uh, what you're saying because I, I don't want people to uh, to take away, uh, you know. Sometimes you know when people have lofty visions, uh, when they're you know when kind of like when they're when they're a little like out there for something that we all can't comprehend. If it's too far down the line, it just seems like you're just talking. And, you know, you just you got a lot of talking going on. But what 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 what, what he what he kind of like is filing on for as a state wise, he, that, that, that's a long, a very long term vision, right? Uh, but it all started in the community because when you, when you build communities, after you build a, a thriving community, the next thing you do, you build a city, right? And the next thing you go from city, you go to state and you go however. Uh, but it, it all have phases, you know. I mean, uh, I had to just, I, I, well, actually, I, I found out when I was in prison when I was doing some studying. Uh, once you know you can, get, you can find some land that's a part of another city or, or municipality, and if, if you have enough people uh, uh, that actually put a petition together, uh, but... It, it, it works like that in Louisiana. I don't know how it's worked on the other states. But the thing is, if you charter that particular city or uh, 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 municipality with, with the state, then you become a city. 
you know, so there's, there's ways on how to do it. It's not, it's, it's, it's not complicated when you have the information, you know, but it starts, it all starts with building the community first. Then you, you, you take it to those next level, but you got to get the community together first before you can even talk, talk about a state or a city, you know? Thank you. And, and so the next set of questions, you know, have to do with approaches and practices um, of community organizers or educators, right? And so uh, one of them is, you know, how, you know, what are some good approaches and practices to use uh, as a community organizer or educator uh, or at, in the school system uh, that helps keep black and brown uh, boys and men stay encouraged to make it out of the school system and beyond? And there's another question related to that, but it speaks about uh, youth who have been impacted by these racially unjust systems uh, who experience trauma in educative spaces, uh, classroom counseling services, for example. You're muted, John. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, during our presentation, I don't know who, who found that question. Uh, it was a point in which uh, we explained that uh, before we was before we formally established Freedom Foundation, we was doing this work as guests in high school from teachers that work for an organization that we became affiliated with through our organizing with those bullet points uh, that we explained earlier. And so, uh, what what that organization did. And it was ran by one of our mentors, Kalamu Yasalam, and Jim Randalls, how we came about in meeting uh, uh, Professor George Lipset and uh, established a relationship with him. Uh, that organization saw fit, just like you're asking how to address these issues of youth in the school, they thought to bring in people who had similar traumatic backgrounds to help facilitate uh, the curriculum or whatever uh, uh, studies that they were taking in class. We've been a part of history classes on a regular basis, not just like you say, we know one and done. We establish relationships. We are community strategists that know the importance of socializing and relationships. We know that trauma can only be healed through establishing genuine relationships. We are skilled in trauma care. So, and that comes from our mentors who I just men mentioned. They thought to bring in people who could hit a little closer, someone who, sh who has shared uh, backgrounds uh, to help facilitate whatever information or education that you were trying to bring out of uh, the student. And so that would be my advice. All right. And I, 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 I can also uh, maybe. Uh, bring some other uh, clarity uh, to that situation. Uh, I like I like I like to use a, a lot of analogies uh, to sort of like get people to really just get it right and understand. In, in, you know, like when in order for order for somebody to know that you're sick, you gotta tell them, right? Or you gotta you gotta uh, 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 display those particular signs. So. What we basically do, we got a, 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 a writing, a critical thinking uh, thing that we do with a lot of these guys and they deal with a lot of writing. So we kind of like, we get them in this circle, it's a confidential circle. Uh, and once we get them to trust us and bring on that confidentiality, then they reveal all their ills, right? They, they vomit up all their ills to us, right? So basically, in a setting like that, they tell us what they, what's wrong with them and we just find the help for them, right? So, but that only can come from people that can, that can relate to those guys. Those guys not gonna reveal that to somebody they can't relate to, right? You have to get the, those guys to bring those things out. And so that's like a part of the, the, the trauma healing because they, they sit on, man, we didn't hear some, 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 some stuff from the, you know, from these kids and they help us to help them, you know. They, they they tell us how to help them, basically, by sharing with us, you know, the, the things that 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 harbor deep down in them, you know. And what we do when they when they vomit that stuff up, we fill them back up with 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 
resolutions or solutions and it make him whole again, you know? So that's how you kind of reach out to a lot of those kids you can use and you, and, and you can communicate with us further and we'll, we, we'll, we'll teach you the method that you can use when you're organizing and working with the youth if, if, if you want to. Well, thank, thank you both, you know, very much. I think um, in terms of what you were just talking about um, at, um, you know, with uh, the students at the center, you know, for the members of Culture Counts Reading Series, you know, uh, at SJSU, I've, I've shared with you before that, you know, our pedagogy of the story circle, you know, uh, it's something I learned through, you know, my own uh, engagement with um, the teachings of uh, Kalamu Ya Salam, as well as with, you know, Freedom Foundations and, um, you know, the work that I did at UC Santa Barbara with the Transformative Pedagogy Project. And so, you know, it's, it's very much invested in uh, education for liberation as opposed to education for mainstream socialization. And I think that, you know, the, the liberatory aspects of uh, education, you know, we see in the actions of uh, Robert uh, and Jerome, you know, and the Freedom Foundations. And so, you know, by carrying on the conversation, you know, you know what are some ways that you would imagine um, continuing this conversation, Jerome and Robert? Um, well, uh, we could have a, a follow-up to this, uh, but my, my, my hope, my ultimate hope, uh, to be honest with you, is that uh, we can get people signed up and continue our Friends of Freedom Foundations, these students, because we started it uh, in our first visit to uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, after we recognized that these unions uh, were at a loss. Uh, and, you know, I could relate. I could relate with being the David to the lie. And so, um, and so we thought to establish Friends of Freedom Foundation where these uh, members of these unions, these young people, these students could organize across state lines. Uh, and, and now with this opportunity, I see fit for uh, that group of Friends of Freedom Foundation to organize for the universities to provide uh, what we could offer to these unions. Uh, and so in, in that way, I, I, I would hope to continue uh, what we started here today, that we can form uh, Friends of Freedom Foundation and their main objective will be to address uh, university departments to provide resources that will allow uh, for Robert and I to come in and help them strategize around the issues uh, that they see fit. And, yeah, and, and it, 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 it's very important, Jonathan, as well, uh, be, be, because of the mere fact that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you know, uh, like folks on this call, I'm just, I mean, just in general, a lot of times, as I say, you know, when you know you, you're going to school, you're doing the right thing, you're, you're trying to get your education, uh, you're on campus a lot or whatever, you just, you know, you're overwhelmed with work or what have you. Sometimes you can get far removed from the community, you know, unconsciously. And, and you know, you, you, you see all the things, but you're so, you're so engulfed with your work and, and, and try to get, you know, you're trying to get ahead, and which is perfectly understandable. Uh, but I think that what, 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 we are, what we are trying to offer, is, as Jerome had, has spoken on, is to continue on our relationship with a lot of, with a lot of these professors in the universities and to aid in those different departments to, uh, strategize with them to show students how they can stay in, in tune with their community because even even for some of your, your loved ones, family and friends who can't attend college, right? A lot of information that you can bring back, you can bring back to them, right? If it's organized. So it's like, you know, killing two birds with one stone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it just, it reminds me of uh, another student at the center, um, you know, uh, a part of their pedagogy, right, is, is you know, student developing, right, together students capable of leading as opposed to students um, who leave, right, and that's what Jerome was mentioning the other day when we, when we spoke, you know, and I think wherever 
you know, students come from, right? They can gain these skills to, to lead uh, in the various ways that uh, are needed, you know, where they come from or, or where they end up, right? Right, uh, you know, I, I tell you, like Robert and I, we could have very well, uh, you know, left quote unquote college because we learned a lot in that institution. Uh, uh, so it was college for us. Uh, and so we have our masters now and we could have gotten out and, and went to Miami and went to California and, and left our communities, you know, much in the same way that I, I've received, you know, from talking to a lot of uh, college students that they feel, they feel like they have uh, abandoned themselves, abandoned the places that they hold so dear to them, their families and, and their neighborhoods, you know, uh, and they can't figure out how to do anything about it. And so uh, we can help with that, you know, we can help with that. And we know that's important. The college is gonna make you believe like it's not important. You don't need that, that's gonna, weigh you back down to where you don't need to be. Like you have to make a decision between this and that. And, and that's not fair. And uh, we hate to see people going through that. So yeah. we would like to help with that. Well, well, well thank you both. We've, we've hit that time. And I just wanna you know, thank everyone who you know, is here and you know, who uh, took the time to show up today to take part. And you know, I'm going on the record here to say that uh, when uh, going to jail, your book that is coming out, right? That, engages the lives of community members in New Orleans youth um, who experience this carceral geographies or, or you know the carceral system in their in the communities in many different ways. I'm going on record to say I'm going to push here to make that a campus book and we could uh, develop engagements that you know bring the Freedom Foundations uh, to San Jose State and you know create a dialogue with our community members here in San Jose that have so much uh, in common with, you know, what y'all are doing. And I think it'll be a very, very wonderful conversation and just a, a generative engagement where we'll come out learning so much together, so much more than we what we would alone. Uh, and just one more time, you know, thank you to the block. Thank you to the Centro. Thank you to Mosaic. Thank you to the Department of Chicano Chicano Studies. Uh, and again, Erlinda Yanez, thank you so much for your support uh, and pushing to make this happen. Um, and I, I wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day and evening. Thank you to the Freedom Foundations. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will engage with you again very soon. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Y'all have, have, have a nice day. And a blessed day. Y'all be safe. All right. All right.